August 15th, 1969. It is 7.15 p.m. It seems like Bert Summers' life might just change forever from this point forward because we are at Woodstock. Welcome to Discography, the podcast that gives Gen X music maniacs a chance to smell like teen spirit again by connecting with a brotherhood obsessed with rating the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever mattered. I'm your host, Dave Gebro, and with three new episodes each week, you're going to gain a comprehensive knowledge of an act's history and output in the time it takes to listen to one album. And in this episode, we'll be turning our spray cans on Bert Summer, along with our very special guests, Angie Pope, Sharon Watts, and Ira Stone. This is part two of our series about the four least fortunate acts that played Woodstock, which we're calling We Are Stardust, We Are Over. In the next hour, we'll learn about the bus ride that changed everything for Bert, the five classics that Bert created before even kicking off his solo career, the blip in time during which Bert managed to become writer and lead vocalist for a classic 1960s Baroque pop band, how he managed to bag 1969 Woodstock as his very first gig, and the varied forces that were aligned against his career ever having a chance to achieve liftoff. Time travel with us back to that beautiful day of August 15th, 1969. Okay, first things first, you need to know just how seriously I take this craziness. Discography is heavily researched, and the music is always reassessed with fresh ears. We don't just cover albums. Uh Uh-uh. We do a searingly honest deep dive analysis of all EPs, singles, comp tracks, relevant solo work, and sometimes bootlegs and live stuff. Every release is slapped with an objectively accurate star rating between 0 and 5, which allows us all the real reason we do this, the Tootsie Pop reward at the center of the rock and roll lolly, to come face to face with the true shape of an artist's overall arc. Be sure to follow along with us chronologically as we go. The link to our legendary playlist is right there in the show notes and on our website at discography.com. Coming up, we've got the remaining two volumes in our We Are Stardust, We Are Over series. Keith Hartley and Quill. So don't miss out. Open up your listening app right now and click follow. And get ready to meet your new friends. They're all kicking it right now in our Facebook group, Discography Soldiers of Sound. That's the best way to find out what's coming up on the show, but there's a hell of a lot more. You get recaps of the day in music history, great artist and track recommendations, polls that put you in the driver's seat on guest and show topic decisions, access to a thriving creative hub if you're looking for your next collaborator, and much more. So make sure you don't miss out. You can find the link to the Discography Soldiers of Sound Facebook page right there in the show notes. And away we go then, with Angie, Sharon, and Ira as we traipse among the celestial spires of the Imaginarium, courtesy of the great and severely underrated Burt Summer, a nonstop achievement machine turned a spent force whose tap had been disabled, first by forces out of his control and then by his own hand. Our guests tonight, we have three of them. One is rating, one is non-rating, and then we have a special cameo appearance. Our guest who is rating became a 60s music nerd at a young age. Today, she's the owner of Miss Angie's Music, which offers music programs for kids up to the age of five along with their parents. And she also performs on weekends as a vocalist with one of Chicago's premier entertainment companies, Beat Mix Music. If her YouTube video playing Burt Summer's smile for gaggles of kids in the park doesn't make you smile, then you've finally gone and died inside. She's also a card-carrying member of Discography's Patreon, the major tier, which means she's regaled with a a three-show-a-week flood of music nerd content to keep her heart happy forever after. Man, did she end up in the right place. Lads and ladies, she's one of us, and she's got a heck of a voice to carry on that age-old Burt tradition. Will you please help me in welcoming Angie Pope? (laughs) Hello. Hello. I'm so 
happy to be here. And that was quite an intro. <laughs> well, you are deserving of it. This has been a big build. But before we dig in here, our non-rating guest didn't even know Bert Summer existed until she went to the museum at Bethel Woods, aka the Woodstock Museum, in December 2017. She very quickly became obsessed with the man, I think it's fair to say, and that obsession gained her entry into Bert's inner circle. She probably, in my estimation, knows more about Bert than any living human being besides possibly Bert's own son. She's been absolutely crucial in the research portion of this rabbit hole investigation and is currently working on an impressionistic portrait slash bio, the working title of which is Smile, the Music Life and Times of Bert Summer, Woodstock's Lost Treasure. The goal? to help him reclaim some of the spotlight he rightfully deserves. Lads and ladies, Sharon Watts. <laughs> Hi guys, nice to be here. Boy, this is something I wouldn't have dreamed would be happening, you know, six years ago, but uh, it's all for Bert and it's all good. It's for you too, come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, because look, you love Bert. You love Bert to a degree that's that's that would be off putting if I wasn't as obsessed with Bert and music in general. You love Bert. <laughs> No, it's great. He's worthy of it. I'm channeling my inner 13-year-old, but, you know, I, if that's the way it comes through, then, you know, I have not really analyzed it other than, you know, he would have been hanging on my walls from my 16 magazine had he been in my 16 magazine. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings up something that's pretty fair. I mean, what I've noticed as far as his legacy goes is that it's no accident that when I advertised the fact that there was a bird summer thing that I got no males in my DMs. Really? Really? Okay, then we got to work on that. <laughs> I agree. But, you know, honestly, the two of you really helped me out a lot because I only really became aware of him 20, 25 years ago, and only really heard the road to travel. And, you know, like Mark Bolin, he always struck me as being truly other, not male, not female, just his own species, like a magical sprite. But I believe he was more talented than Bolin, and he was the real deal. How about the two of you? I mean, like, how do your, you know, your lives before Bert and after, I mean, how, how does he enter into things for the two of you? Well, man, I completely agree with you on that. I think his talent eclipses a lot of big names from that era. I mean, he should be right up there with uh, a lot of other singer-songwriters from that time. And you've known of him way longer than I have. Actually, my husband discovered him watching YouTube, you know, and just like a lot of us saw the Jennifer video. And this was probably in 2019. We we're both Woodstock buffs. So we were gearing up for that 50 year anniversary. And we discovered this person we didn't even know was a part of Woodstock. And we had both been very into Woodstock for a long time. So it was quite a find. And, and like Sharon, I think I became completely obsessed with finding everything I could about him. And there's really not that much out there. And I'm hoping we can change that. Well, we are currently changing that at this yeah. moment, thank God. Like you, I was, I've was i always been, well, I don't know if you were obsessed with Woodstock. I was. I uh, absolutely was. For, I, I think I saw the movie when I was about 10 years old. You know, the sad part of it is people who don't really know Woodstock have absolutely no chance at knowing who Bird Summer is. And you and I being obsessed with Woodstock, we still didn't know who he was. Yeah, exactly. And that really speaks to what really is going on here. I was not obsessed with Woodstock. <laughs> And I was, uh, I could have gone, like I was, you know, age appropriate, a little bit younger, but, you know, somebody could have given me a ride, um, barely on my radar. And so for me, I'm approaching it also from hearing the song Jennifer for the first time. I had gone to the museum and I came home and decided, gee, there's a whole lot of people I didn't, I never heard of. And so I took out a coffee table book and propped up my iPad and just started going through the YouTubes in order of performance. And when I got to Bird, you know, which is at the beginning, near the beginning, Jennifer, you know, it, it's, it's just something grabbed me, like when he switched gears, you know, when he goes into that, whoa, I'm lost in a maze. Like first I thought, oh, this is nice. He's cute, blah, blah, whatever. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm 69 years old. So I was like, how excited am I going to get about this? And then just something grabbed me when he switched gears and I realized there's just a lot of depth here and it was just a weird visceral grab, you know, and I immediately started Googling and trying to find out more. And there was 
hardly anything. So that intrigued me. And then, you know, at that point, I just, I can't resist a rabbit hole. So I just started going down them. And uh, so like, I'm the opposite of you guys that really didn't know a whole lot about Woodstock, but I do pay attention to my inner visceral gut about what grabs me and what interests me, and uh, and I check it out. Your presence here is a serious bonus. I mean, it was going to be just Angie and I, and then it became you. And you know, as far as you know, getting a, a roadmap of his life, we could not have done this accurately without you. I'm still bumbling my way around it, believe it or not, with the timeline for such a short life, <laughs> so jammed packed with really fascinating detail that it astounds me that nobody else is doing this or at least to my knowledge you know um that i seem to be the archivist in chief here you know i just want to get it down basically for you know history but you have a very personal connection with it and i feel confident in saying that because of the way in which you're writing this book an impressionistic bio i haven't read the book because it, it's not done yet but you know impressionistic what that means is that to me there's intimations of you inserting yourself into the story uh, kind of like hunter s thompson would it, almost like a gonzo journalistic approach but there's obviously you feel an intense I'm guessing personal connection with this. Uh, actually, kind of the <laughs> opposite of what you're saying is how oh, really? I uh, how I'm using the word impressionistic. I never dreamed I would get enough information, nor was I interested in doing a biography. I wanted to get other people's impressions, not mine. I want to keep myself out of this and really bop around and, and collect stories from people who knew him or worked with him or loved him or, you know, and I didn't think I would find enough people from every era. So I was using the word impressionistic a little bit as a cop out because I knew I would never get the kind of information that, say, uh, a Janis Joplin biography would have by, you know, Holly George Warren. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I was giving myself a little wiggle room. <laughs> Well, that's interesting. I'm glad you corrected me on that because that was the the impression I had of it. But I'm enormously interested to read the book. I can't wait for when it comes out. And we'll re-release the episode when it's published. You know, now these days, uh, it, knowing what I know now about Bert, I honestly just feel enormously bad for the guy because despite being involved in two of the most famous countercultural events of the 60s, Hare and Woodstock, and despite having the first standing ovation during Woodstock, Summer's name was somehow always left out of the historical recollection of all things Woodstock over the years. And his friends say that it felt to him as if he didn't exist. Yes, and uh, Pete Pornatel really wrote the first, to my knowledge, post-Woodstock book that actually included Bert and in a way that wasn't just a misspelled name in a set list that was incorrect anyways, which was what right. most of these books were doing up until 2009. And he called him uh, the Rodney Dangerfield of rock and roll. And uh, and he was a friend of Bert's. He recognized that Bert was being ignored and disrespected and, and it just was unfair and, and he didn't deserve it. But he recognized it, you know, from knowing the guy all the way back to playing his first, rec you know, the road to travel on his radio station. And that's how he met Bert. So he has a nice chapter on Bert in his book, Back to the Garden from 2009. But to my knowledge, that's like the first recognition of Bert as a singer, a talented singer, and a neglected, forgotten performer. And it just was unfair and shouldn't be. So right. hats off to Pete Fornatel, you know. And I actually just bought that book. I haven't started reading it yet, but I bought it because of that. I think maybe you posted something about that. But it absolutely is a shame. I mean, he's not in the movie. He's not in any of the soundtracks. He's not even on that that monument plaque that's there. And it's so, so sad to me. I, I agree. I mean, that's part of what drew me into his story is just the talent and everything that he did at such a young age. And then it was just like this slow descent into obscurity. It's unbelievable. The The guy has four albums. And immediately I knew this was not going to be a single episode. It's a double episode, not just because of his life, but because there there's so much to hang on to in such a brief career. 
This guy was a supernova. I do want to say as far as episode rules go, the only rule here is that typically we don't consider live sets as a contender for, you know, top three albums or what have you, and we don't usually spend a lot of time on it, but this is Woodstock. So we're not only going to be spending a, a bunch of time on it, but we're going to get um, one of his two instrumental supporters, Ira Stone, his lead guitarist for the show, is going to be a guest only during that segment. So first I want to do a little segment that I affectionately call the run-up, which gets us in as brief a, a span of time as possible to the first release. But in this particular case, Bert was so quickly in his life hitting the ground running that I don't have a lot of detail I want to sit on. He was born February 7th, 1949, a fellow Aquarian like myself, uh, born in New York City, grew up in Queens and Hartsdale. Uh, he was a self-taught musician, piano and guitar, began writing songs in his teens, and started becoming friendly with other young musicians and songwriters in the area, including most prominently Leslie Weinstein, who became Leslie West, and Michael Brown of The Left Bank. Burt wound up writing several songs for Leslie West's band, The Vagrants, uh, including their single Beside the Sea, which was co-written with the producer Felix Papalardi and his wife Gail Collins. That brings us very quickly then to phase one, A Cavalcade of Opportunity, 1967 to 1971. Very first stop on the, on the train here, Burt and Bill. So 1967, there is a single that comes out. The A side is You're What Makes My Lonely Life Worth Living. And the, and the flip is A Different Time. Uh, is it fair to say that we know who Bert is, but we have no idea who Bill is? Yeah, I know who Bill is. Oh, you do? Okay. Because the last time yeah. I read, we don't know who he is. Uh, Bill was uh, Billy Canfield, a friend of his in uh, you know junior high school, high school. They paired up and there were groups back in the day that were you know influenced by the Beatles. And he and Billy formed a duo, uh, initially coming out of a doo-wop group called the, uh, the I think, the Gothams. I don't have my notes in front of me, but anyways, read the book. <laughs> yeah. um, Are you going to give us purposely fuzzy information so we have to buy your book? No, my brain is purposely <laughs> fuzzy, and that's what I'm using. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I didn't think I'd find out who Bill was. And I even asked Trey Martin, who was the arranger for the single, and he didn't remember. Eventually, it came to light because I found a bunch of guys that knew Bert from junior high school, and I've been interacting with them. And so once that early era opened up to me, I knew I could sink my teeth into his life story. This was immediately a shocker to me because the A-side, You're What Makes My Lonely Life Worth Living, Living is a gorgeous story time fairy tale dreamer pop song. Mm -hmm. It's kind of in the monkey's lane, like the Davy Jones kind of stuff, uh, mm -hmm. but better and really, really soft and gentle on the ears. Totally influenced, to my ears at least, by lullabies with a super pleasant light psych poppy melody that graces it. And you know, most surprisingly, it's of extremely high quality. And it's even capped off with one of my favorite little things, which is an elegant little vocal round until the fade. And then on the flip, a uh, different time, it's a more folk influenced tune, but with the same kind of innocence embedded in its, in its core. I would just call it Peter Pan pop. Incredibly to me, this is my favorite piece of the pre-Road to Travel puzzle. And uh, Sharon, I know you're not rating anything, but I give this four and a half stars. I love this single. Excellent. I love it, too. Just an aside, Trade Martin was uh, very, you know, high up in the grill building. So it's no accident that the production was incredible on that single. But the and, uh, too. It's not like he needed some time to. Yeah, oh, no. Yeah. I don't think Bert wrote uh, Side B. I only play Side A. <laughs> Oh, I like I like them both, hey, Angie. You, I'm I'm dying here. What? Well, yeah, talk, talk um, I, I'm with you on this. I actually gave this four and a half stars as well. It's just it's a beautifully crafted pop song, in my opinion. The harmonies that you know what I love about this song and a lot of Bert's stuff is it it grows on me the more I hear it. I mean, when I when I first heard this one, I was like, oh, this is nice. And then I kept listening to it, and I was like, wow, that that opening piano riff is so cool, and 
it's just such a pleasant song. I mean, how did this not go anywhere? I don't know. Yeah, was- I, I don't get it. And, you know, yeah. I'm a big fan of whimsical psych, but this has a sophistication about it that belies the fact that it's the first goddamn thing he ever released. This was the first indication I had that this is going to be a two-part episode. Then The Vagrants. The best place besides our hallowed playlist to get the Vagrants material is the I Can't Make a Friend compilation, which collects material from between 1965 and 1968. They're a garage rock band, but, you know, because they had Burt writing songs, they had, you know, a whole bunch of sophisticated threads that were running through the more standard garage material. What do you ladies think about the Vagrant stuff? I have to be honest, I wasn't super familiar with a lot of mountain stuff until I met my husband, but it's interesting to hear some of these things, you know, early, early Leslie West, because like, a song like Beside the Sea, I mean, Mountain did that at Woodstock. The non burt stuff, there's a, a, a couple of really good songs that are deserving of mention. You're Too Young and I Can't Make a Friend are incredible. I Can't Make a Friend is their second single from 1966. Again, this is not Burt. And You're Too Young is, is right up my alley, a really dreamy minor key ballad done in a burt-rific, swoony manner that reminds me of the of the band The Poets from the mid-60s, that kind of minor key dirge. I think the vagrants hung very convincingly in this lane, which is unsurprising seeing as Burt was in the band, but as a garage band, it's, you know, you gotta love when they can pull off a ballad. I think there's only one classic Burt composition that the vagrants do, uh, and that's Your Hasty Heart. Oh, man, I love this song and here's a a total nerd reference for you this song to me sounds like if don't call on me by the monkeys and hello stranger by barbara lewis had a baby yeah Yeah, i can get with that for sure i came to the vagrants through bert but i had known about them because i had been married to a guy who had friends from Long Island that that used to go to, you know, the Action House. Uh, You know, I was not a Leslie West fan. I Nothing, you know, it was kind of (laughs) like, thank you, Bert, you've introduced me now to some (laughs) music that I otherwise never would have listened to. Bert was never, I don't know if I misheard you, but he was never in the Vagrants. So, you know, I have their music now, and I'm going to have to listen to it again, because you're talking about stuff that he um, didn't simultaneously record himself. So I don't think this stuff is exceptional. I think he uh, contributed some solid songs. The the Final Hour is a nice little 1966 pop song, and the early version of And When It's Over is good, but it, it got better later. And actually, And When It's Over was the Vagrant's fourth and final single single in 67. It's so different from Bert's version, you know, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. So it, interesting to think how that one song can have two completely different personalities, depending who's singing it. You know, it's very strange, too, how it's a very funny combination of Leslie West's extremely macho energy and Bert's feminine energy. So I don't know what necessarily the thought process was blending it but it gets a bigger feeling because there's a much larger gamut of emotions to explore but overall i give this material three and seven eighth stars but bert's material specifically i give three stars um it's not my favorite early bird stuff but it's solid and angie you had given me it was three and a half right yeah i would give it about i i i did each song individually but it's all between three and a half and there's a couple fours i mean i really like the final hour i gave that a four onward and upward as far as i'm concerned so in 67 Bert joined Michael Brown's band, the legendary and amazing The Left Bank, as the lead singer, replacing Steve Martin Caro and co-writing their single And Suddenly with Michael Brown. So he also sang lead on Ivy Ivy, which was uh, written by Tom Fair. And Mm -hmm. the group, which included, oddly, Michael McKeon from Spinal Tap, etc., on bass, very soon fell apart following legal threats by all the band members' lawyers. But before that happened, he sailed into, through, and out the other side of the left bank. <clears throat> Let's talk about the very odd pairing of Ivy Ivy and and Suddenly. Two totally different songs. And I have to say, uh, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Ivy Ivy. 
I, I didn't really dig that one. Now, and suddenly was right up my alley. I, I love it. You know, it's it reminded me I mean, again, we're bringing up the monkeys, but it reminded me of something Davy Jones would sing, you know, it's actually a dead ringer for daddy's song from head. Oh my gosh, from head. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Years ago, I knew a man. <laughs> Without the horns, but yeah, right. you're right. Yeah, you know, matter. I have the opposite outlook on this. So okay. Ivy Ivy, I give five stars and, and suddenly I give two and a quarter. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So Ivy Ivy, I love, because it's kind of this weird, creepy song. It works and yet it doesn't work, which makes it work even more for me. What I'm referring to is his voice is tamped way down in the mix and double tracked along with the session guy horns and the eerily high pitched background vocals in the chorus. And it makes for a really odd disembodied feeling in the production that makes me unable to compare it to anything. And I really like that. Ivy Ivy is written by Michael Brown and Tom Fair, but the flip is by Michael and Bert. And to me, it's just full blown Vegas. Like all the mystery and pull of Ivy Ivy to me is gone from the second and suddenly starts. It really doesn't work for me. Whenever and suddenly comes up on my, I've got a left bank CD compilation. And uh, whenever it comes up, I always, I'm always, woo, here it comes. <laughs> So it puts me in a good mood, but I love Ivy Ivy too. I guess I'm just thrilled that, you know, something came out of the left bank that's on record that, you know, Bert was part of. He he and Michael McKean were barely in it. I mean, you know, you blink and they're gone. You know who else is in uh, the left bank at that time, right? Steven Tyler from Aerosmith. Bert was in the weird middle period, but there's a second Left Bank album, you know, and Bert was gone by that point. Steven Tyler's on that record. Let's talk about the unreleased song, Men Are Building Sand, because I don't know what the fuck that was doing left in the vaults. This song is a doozy. I don't know if Grizzly Bear has ever heard this song, but it seems like their entire career is based on this song. It's just like this chamber pop of an extremely cerebral variety. And it's crazy to me that it was discarded. This, to me, is the best thing he ever did with the Left Bank. I give it. I give Men Are Building Sand five stars. So interesting. I I gave that one three stars. I just thought it was odd. It's weird. It, it, it's a really weird one. But what I will say here is I love that Bert's songwriting. I mean, nothing really sounds like anything else he's he takes chances on stuff and men are building sand is just really really odd but i applaud it because it's so unique i mean what about that like what that. about that one note he hits on the chorus you know what i'm talking about right the way he sings the the actual title is oh men are building sand right. i don't know what i mean <laughs> That, that's michael brown <laughs> that's amazing to me i love that love it that's the collaboration between michael and bert michael would write the music and at that point tom fair was fed up with trying to come up with lyrics because he said you had to be a mind reader to to have michael figure out what he wanted for his music right and tom, tom handed it over to bert and said here you have a go at it <laughs> And uh, that's what he came up with. So yeah, and he wrote is, about men building sand. It's interesting. There's such a mood to it. The mood just hangs real heavy over it. Even Left Bank fans, I'm sure most of them, at least 50% of them, do not know that any of the Burt material exists. Which is a shame, you know? It's totally. Because whether you're a fan or not a fan, you can tell they're going for something. But then, most importantly, a guy named James Rado walks on a bus, and Burt Summer's life changes, doesn't it, Sharon? Yeah. He spotted Burt on the bus and uh, thought, this guy looks like he could fit in our new musical. <laughs> so James Rado, the co-creator of Hair, comes, uh, walks onto a bus uh, in New York and discovers this very striking, extremely tall gentleman with giant hair. He was going to come on to the L.A. production as just an ensemble player, and it evolved to him being cast as, as Wolf. 
And he replaced Joe Bryath, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Who I also have a total obsession around. I think Joe Bryath was amazing. That first album is really what I mean. Very sad story. There's a movie, there's a documentary about him that is mm -hmm. fantastic. Joe Bryath wanted to leave hair because he was really antsy to bust out as the first openly gay rock star diva. <clears throat> you know, we'll definitely be having a Joe Bryath episode, but that's a similarly doomed, tra tragic story. But the music is similarly like surprisingly great in autumn of 1968 bert gets into the opening of hair in la crucially at just around that time in addition to getting his face printed right on the cover of the hair program bert's manager dominic cecilia introduced bert to a guy named Artie Kornfeld, who signed bert on the spot to his first record deal so at the time Artie was Capitals Vice President of Rock Music. And of course, he'd soon go on to become one of the producers of Woodstock. Right place, right time. And this was Bert's story at this point is a flood of right place, right time, right place, right time. Yeah, so yep. many amazing things going on here for him. And also, Angie, it's extremely upsetting to have so many things go your way as if the universe is propelling you forward inexorably to only then have it change like 180 degree change in the opposite direction. Sometimes I, I listen to the Woodstock set. It's like, oh my God, that was like the top of the hill. And then it, it, may, it almost makes me sad. If it almost makes you sad and that's it, then you're dead inside. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> come on, it should make you weep. Well, you know, it, it's come close. Oh, that counts. So in 1968, an outfit called Child Harold with an E at the end of child to, of course, underscore their 1700s-ness of their psychedelia, they do a, a, a version of Brink of Death. It's in the same Baroque vein as the left bank. Burt wrote Brink of Death, uh, recorded by this band with an arrangement by Wendy Walter Carlos. And I think it's amazing. Whimsical, flute-laden, totally top shelf five stars. I gave this one a three and a half. I, I find it super interesting compared to Bert's version, obviously. I mean, this is so trippy, so psychedelic. It, I mean, I feel like I'm on an acid trip when I'm listening to it, honestly. Yeah, I mean, I like those, you know, studio bound psych kitchen sink productions. So this is right up my alley. All these little pockets of his career at this point are so fascinating because He's not only getting all these opportunities, but he's like, he's, he's hitting them out of the park, left and right. You know, next up, we have the, the next Michael Brown project, which is Montage. Uh, I've had this record for, for quite a while. It was recorded in 68, released in January 69. Burt co-wrote five of the 10 tracks with one additional unreleased Burt track as well. And that one is thankfully Magnifico. So many good songs. I Shall Call Her Mary, great song. She's Alone is great. Men Are Building Sand is great, and Desiree is great. Uh, now I want the two of you to tear me up and tell me that, <laughs> no, the entire thing is brilliant. So I um, actually had not listened to Montage until I was doing research for this podcast. I, oh, wow. I, just, I didn't know about it. Wow. So um, She's Alone is so odd. It's very, it's a very interesting melody. And Ooh, really <laughs> interesting. So interesting. I mean, for that, it's sad. It, it's not something that I want to listen to, but I give it props for being uh, such a unique tune. And it, it it's, just, it's almost it, foreboding. Yeah, yeah. And the sadness of it reminded me like it's a, a She's Leaving Home by the Beatles or something, you know, like just sadness. You know, my guess is that Michael Brown had a, had a firmer hand in the construction of She's Alone than Bert because the top line, the, the melody, the thing is so questingly outre. It's just so out and so, you know, focused on the black keys of the piano. Uh, I could be wrong there. Sharon, maybe you have a light to shine on that. What little light I have, because I don't listen to this a whole lot, but I think any collaboration he does with Mike Brown, Mike's music is kind of like the what we start with. Mm -hmm. And Bert, Bert's lyrics incorporate them. So I really think in, in this particular collaboration, Mike's music is the groundwork. Um, and 
Bert makes the lyrics. For this record, it, in a sense, it feels like Bert's starting to truly feel himself. It wouldn't be surprising to me, based on his vice-like grip of the first phase of the left bank, that Michael would have been the one to kick things off uh, in the construction of the tunes. But like I said, this was the only pre-road to travel work that he had done with which I was already familiar. And, and I love it. I think he's firing on most of his cylinders here. And if I'm docking it for anything, it's that, uh, like Phil Oaks, Pleasures of the Harbor and other records like that, it's very brainiacal, if I can use that, to impart more than a purely cerebral reaction to. I think the unbridled emotionality of Bert's songwriting and performance style would find full flower once Michael Brown receded into his rear view and he began writing all by himself. Still a massive achievement, four and a quarter stars. I gave it four stars. It was just so interesting and it was like a, a fun find for me are you meaning to say we're kind of in agreement a little bit yeah That's <laughs> i think so <laughs> yeah. i i like this quote michael brown uh, said of Bert, working with Bert was truly like working with a genius. Bert taught himself everything. He would play piano without thumbs early on, just four fingers on each hand. We wrote many songs together, and I also had a great time playing with him live on stage in his early career. Bert was very intelligent and very perceptive. He could see through anything. His blue eyes would be ablaze when we talked. And then, Sharon, then what happens? <laughs> <laughs> then what happens? Our guy kicks into a solo career. Oh, that. Okay. <laughs> I was just thinking about <laughs> that quote because I had just put it in the book. We're over an hour into the recording of this and we just got to album one. To, to the album. So yeah, Artie's producing this album and he's got hair. And uh, Is this you know, a concept I, album? I don't think so. I think these are just all the songs he was writing when he was 18 years old, and he collected them together, and he would sing them in Central Park on a blanket. I mean, he never played these anywhere. He, he never played the coffee houses in the village. He would hang out there, and he knew everybody, and he never played in them. He would only play uh, in parks or in people's living rooms or his own living room, which I find... I was like, whoa, you know, I mean, because that leads up to the fact that his first live gig was, you know what? <laughs> well, how about this? Angie, why don't you take us through the record and then well, we'll we'll chime in behind you. Sounds good. So th this is the record I'm most excited to talk about because it's my favorite. And when I was, you know, becoming obsessed <laughs> with Bert, I found this entire album on YouTube. And I just, I remember listening to it, driving home from a gig, and I could not believe how awesome this was. We'll just start at the top, I guess. And When It's Over is the first tune. I had heard the Woodstock version first, and that I do prefer the Woodstock version. I, I'm not wild about the arrangement with the, the strings and the horn a little bit. I, I loved the pared down guitar version of it from Woodstock, but Man, what a song. I think it's a great one. First of all, is that chorus rousing? Holy crap. Oh, my God, yeah. It also serves as a terrific opener. You got to love the fact that it's called And When It's Over and it starts the record. <laughs> um, it's uh, got that mysterioso Tim Buckley-ish uh, sort of folk. You know, I'm talking about Tim Buckley from his first record. You know, with the nylon string, the fat bass, and the really tasteful string accompaniment. And the strings don't drown it out. It just augments, as do the horns. So there's a horn solo section that does a sort of duet with the strings that's really solid. A, a bit of high-class production artistry there. And this time out, I don't know if it was a learning from And Suddenly, but it doesn't have a Vegas sheen to it. <laughs> I and I don't I don't enjoy the horn solo. I I think it makes it sound a little schlocky to me. It's very Burt Bacharach, you know, and he was very popular at that time. And I I sense the horns and the strings to me are like that's Burt Bacharach. So that was the influence. I'm I'm pretty sure because. You know, I just know. Yeah, <laughs> I that, have that the soundtrack sense. that promises, promises. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, from '68. That's a that's a great soundtrack. You know, so that's already Kornfeld doing his Burt Bacharach thing. Then we're at Jennifer. This is. Yeah. What do you think? This is his most famous song. I would say so. I mean, I think especially now that's how most people discover Bird is hearing this song first. I'm sure both of you know it's uh, oddly about Jennifer Warren's. 
Bart right. had joined uh, the L.A. cast in Hair, and Jennifer Warnes was the female lead. He apparently, you know, approached her backstage with the song, and uh, this is what Jennifer Warnes has to say about Bert. He told me it was a song using my name as the title, but he apologized for embellishing it a bit with the kissing her here in the grass part. Eight shows a week and almost three hours on stage per show was an exhausting schedule that gave actors almost no time to forge lasting friendships. I had no indication that Bert had any deep feelings for me. I thought I read somewhere that Jennifer Warren's first solo album, they put the some of the lyrics from Jennifer on the back cover. The person that designed that album was Victor Kahn, and uh-huh. he was a good friend of Bert, and so... He was responsible for that, yeah. This is probably the song in which he's most redolent of Donovan, right? I mean, wouldn't you say? It, Absolutely. It could be the association of the name Jennifer, too, you know, with, with uh, Jennifer Juniper. Okay, then after Jennifer, which is obviously a classic, uh, Things Are Going My Way. Things Are Going My Way. I like this song. I, again, love the Woodstock version of it better. I, I just didn't enjoy the little, like, flute in there. I don't know. It just It's a fun pop tune, but it didn't work for me until I heard the Woodstock version of it. What do you think, Sharon? Because I'm a little bit older than you guys, uh, it, it evokes things that I was listening to on the radio, like the 59th Street Bridge song. It's yeah. got the girl bill thing going on. I understand where it's coming from. It's boppy. Uh, I don't mind the, the pipe or the flute because the whole Pied Piper thing kind of plays into my book a little bit. <laughs> and also Artie Kornfeld, uh, you know, his book was called The Pied Piper of Woodstock. So I take all of that into account and uh, I'm fine with it. <laughs> I think he surprisingly pulls this off. It's redolent to me of peak turtles. And this is the only attempt of his at Sunshine Pop that for me really pulls it off. I love this song. And most importantly, I buy it. I don't feel like he's it's a put on. I feel like he feels like things are going his way and you can feel that. So I think it's great. Things really were going his way at the time. I was just going to say, Bert <laughs> wrote his emotions. So this, that definitely this, this was how he felt. What I do love about this album and maybe why it wasn't successful is because it was so eclectic. I mean, there was there was folk, there was this fun pop tune, there was psychedelia and there was some really dramatic ballads. It was kind of all over the place. But I like that about it. Back then, it wasn't necessarily Uh, a bad idea to be eclectic. I mean, there was free form radio happening all over the place, but that doesn't mean it was any easier to market if you tried to do 10 things on a record. All right, She's Just a Girl, probably my second favorite tune on this album. It's uh, kind of dreamy and oh, she's just a girl. I just love it. Sharon, do you hate this song? No, uh, this definitely appeals to the, you know, 14 year old in me. (laughs) Yeah. I love the vibraphone work on this as well. Bert loves those waltz time ballads. And this one, you know, he really pulls off with finesse. It's a great song. Again, sounding like Tim Buckley's self-titled debut, uh, circa 1966, especially because of the harpsichord and vibraphone and that waltz time romanticism. is totally right on point. All right, the next one, Tonight Together. This is an interesting and funky, fun little number, I think. It's trying to rock a little bit, but I'm not sure that it gets there. What do you think? I feel like the lessons he learned from Leslie West were applied here because there's definitely a vagrance kick to this one. It's definitely not the first song I think of when I think of Burt, but it's really top shelf. And it's a much more strident pop tune with really awesome blues based piano rolls to it. We got a title track coming up around the bend. Oh, gosh. Okay. The Road to Travel. Now, I will tell you, when I was driving home listening to this for the first time, I wept. There was something about this song and his his delivery. I mean, I'm getting choked up talking talking about it like yeah. here's the thing i i'm not a fan of the harmonica but the harmonica in that tune just gave me goosebumps and then when he starts singing oh i was wondering at the time i'm not sure like how 
autobiographical was this tune. I just felt like, man, his his father hates him. And like, what was he going through at that time? This was a generational thing that was prevalent at that time with the hair. It was a huge thing. And it was symbolic of the splits between the gen, you know, the generation gap. And he even said to his dad, Pops, you know, you know, these are just words, you know. I think it was more than slightly autobiographical, but he wanted to reassure his dad, don't take this personally, because, you know, he loved his father, but he left home when he was 17. And the lyrics, you know, Mr. Tiny Second All, surely you will make me fall. To me, that was just so, I don't know, like you said, sad and prescient and self-aware. And that's what strikes me with this song. He has so much self-awareness. And they say self-awareness avails us nothing. And like Angie, you know, my first note is, I love that yearning, keening hobo harmonica, much more firmly based on folk roots. And I think this is like his anthem. I mean, that's what it feels like. Mm -hmm. like it was like it was meant to be played at his funeral. It's got that kind of heft and import to it. At this point, we're six songs in. Every song is a great song. So I believe on the actual record, this is side two. The opener is She's Gone. It's a beautifully sad song. I've got a heart next to it in my notes. It's another classic, I think. You know, I, he does that autumnal ballad so well. And the rest of the players such stellar empathetic backing from them the vibe on this kind of reminds me of nico's chelsea girl album it's the most accessible nico solo album the next two songs this is the only pothole in the record hold the light it's not a bad song it's kind of a strident rocker which i believe wasn't playing to his strengths i like the choruses the verses are not my favorite melodically, but the middle eight solid and the build to the chorus is good. And then a simple man, another strident one. He's kind of doubling down in an area I truly don't believe is his zone of strength. I think he should have doubled down on the Donovan male witch variant vibe. A simple man is not exceptional to me. It's the only song I wish wasn't on the record. It's also the only vocal I don't like either. His falsetto in the chorus is off pitch. And the sections where he belts with a sneer, I'd give a thumbs down to. Also, the scream before the fade. Again, when I think belter, when I think rocker, I do not think summer. A Simple Man is, the I think, the only bad song on the record. And Hold the Light is simply solid. I completely agree with you on A Simple Man. Not a great tune, in my opinion. I actually really like Hold the Light. And while we're talking about, you don't think of, of rockers when you think of Burt. But what I think is interesting about Bert's voice is that he had different facets to his voice. I mean, he had the the folky, nat really natural tone, which I love. He had a raspy rock voice. You know, in certain tunes, it comes out and it does come out and hold the light. I don't know if I ever told you this, Sharon, but I have a Bert Summer, the musical going on in my head. <laughs> and uh, Hold the Light is in the Bert Summer, the musical. We're, yeah, um, we're working on this. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I'm with you on A Simple Man. And I actually wrote, I, I don't care for the falsetto. And that, yeah, I know what you're talking about with that screen, Dave. <laughs> it's like, ooh, um, not yeah, a fan yeah, of, of yeah, the vocal yeah. at all. And I agree with you. If it wasn't on the album, it would be okay. Yeah, I agree with, with Angie on the um I love all the variations of this voice. It's been fun to discover them as I've been, you know, involved with this and realizing he can switch gears, at, you know, the drop of a dime. But um, and it, it worked for me and Jennifer. That's what grabbed me where he just, I, I mean, it's all I can call it is switching gears. But this gear shifting that he's doing in this song is just a little over the top for me and um, just doesn't work. And and uh, we'll get into it later, too, about the way he learns to control his voice and use it to great effect. It's almost like he becomes aware of its power as the years go by. And yeah. But yeah, these two also, not, I, I'm, hold the light, I'm not totally in love with. But then we're back on track. I mean, Brink of Death is a great tune, striking orchestration, and a wonderful soaring melody. Obviously, we know it from its earlier iteration, but his version is outstanding, obviously. Uh, and then the closer, a note that red is great. It's just, I wish the those two songs together is just like a pothole, then we're back on track for me. I completely agree. I, I, I mean, the last, so the last two tunes that we're talking about, they are dark. I mean, it's, you know, about death, but, but they're really well written. Gosh, a note that red was so dark. I really, it made me think like, gosh, he was 
Was he just creating a story or was he really thinking about suicide? I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's really, really dark. A note that read, that feels like all things must pass a year before that song was written. I smell a lawsuit. So Bert's <laughs> son, give me a ring. I want a cut of the earnings. I mainly only want to get involved for the irony of the lawsuit. Since George Harrison is already a well-known copycat artist, everyone knows that if you're a real Chiffons fan, for crying oh, yeah. out loud. Anyway, a note that read is a great closer and another great song from Bert's pen and throat. And there's even a few moments where his vocal style seems to mimic that Robin Gibb waiver. I've known this record for a couple decades now, but it truly and honestly took all this time for me to really hear how great it is. Not just because I'm forced to face you obsessed ladies, it just clobbered me over the head with its excellence on this listen go around. I mean, I, I listened to it a bunch of times. It's an amazing set of songs. The only thing about it really that falls short is that two song stretch that tries its hand at reaching the back row. It turns out all he needed to do was lay back in the pocket and make hundreds of thousands of people lean toward him. Four and three quarter stars. I agree. I, I actually gave this album five stars even though it's got you know the one tune that i don't like i i love this album so much the road to travel you're traveling down a road with him through different emotions and different genres and it's just so exceptional to me Sharon, you hate this record? <laughs> oh, yeah. I was just gobsmacked, you know, by the fact that an 18-year-old was writing these lyrics. I really could not comprehend that. It, was, it took many listenings, and I just kept repeating the dark lyrics and then the upbeat ones coexisting, the dichotomy just wove me into it all. Uh, it's very confessional. Some of it seems deceptively simple and upbeat, and yet it all comes across to me as a fully formed creative person, you know? He knows what to do with his very real emotions and to turn it into art, you know? Otherwise, he could end up like, you know, a note that read, you know? I think he, yeah. on a certain level, is aware of that. And this is how he um, deals with it. Ladies, just imagine, if you will, close your eyes. We're getting into a chopper together, okay? We're soaring into the blue heavens and uh, f starting to fly over a farm. It looks like it's uh, Max Yasger's farm. And it looks like a tremendous amount of little ants on the ground. Hundreds of thousands of them, actually. And it's August 15th, 1969. It is 7.15 p.m. It seems like Bert Summers' life might just change forever from this point forward because we are at Woodstock. Back in ye old days of the mid-1960s, our super secret special guest met Leslie West of the Vagrants, whom he considered a mentor and with whom he'd later collaborate on the great Fatsby record. He also played in the road band for the music explosion of a little bit of soul fame in early 69. He answered an ad in the Village Voice placed by a one Burt Summer, who was preparing to tour behind the road to travel. Their first live gig? was Woodstock. Along with bass player Charlie Bolello, he performed a 10-song set on Friday, August 15th, 1969, that started at 7.15 p.m. and lasted around 40 minutes. Our guest recorded the whole set on a portable tape recorder for his own keepsake, which became the set's definitive oral document until 2019. He continued to accompany Burt after Woodstock, even performing at Carnegie Hall with him. But he also started writing and performing with his wife, Maxine. In 1975, they released their first album, Max and I, distributed by Roulette Records, which included Leslie West and Corky Lang from Mountain. Lads and ladies out in the trash-scattered, crop-stomped, Yasger ruins of hippie yesteryear, will you please help me in welcoming Ira Stone. Hey, how you doing, Dave? That intro was a corrective measure for the complete horseshit intro of Let's Welcome Mr. Burt Summers and some of his friends. We were actually thrilled to be uh, up on that stage anywhere way back then. So we were at that point, we we're getting ready to play. We don't even know what he said, but you're right. History several time refers to Burt as Mr. Burt Summers. Unfortunately, uh, we never made the cut for the album the uh, or the movie. Okay, so this is a series that I'm doing entitled We Are 
where Stardust We Are Over, uh, about the four least fortunate acts that played Woodstock. I'm covering Sweetwater, Burt Summer, the Keith Hartley Band, and Quill. So in my research, I have found that I really like two of the bands, and then two of them were, I think, deserving, not deserving of obscurity, but they were never going to be big. And I think those two are Sweetwater and Keith Hartley. Burt, and the work that you did with Charlie and Quill, I think are very much deserving of exhumation and reconsideration. And to top it all off, and I'm talking about even like Sly Stone and some really cool looking people. Oh, and Roger Daltrey with that, that famous tasseled vest. You could be the coolest looking motherfucker who was on <laughs> Asgard Farm that weekend. You are the coolest looking motherfucker, man. <laughs> the story goes when they were taking pictures backstage, uh, Elliot Landy was doing a lot of photography. Uh, they took pictures of me and Bert and Maxine in her uh, Bedouin dress. And when the special edition of Life magazine came out right after Woodstock, they cut me and Bert out of the picture and put Max in there. So there's a picture of Maxine in the dress in the centerfold where they listed all the bands. And unfortunately, until 20 years later, when Life magazine came back to visit us here in Connecticut, they put in the full picture. Yeah, Max made the cut and Bert and I didn't. Yeah, I'm looking at the picture. Thank you for the hair compliment. It's not just the hair, your mustache, the, sh the open shirt. You look like you, you like you were the main guy. Hey, man, it was hot. It was August. <laughs> It's true. I know how uh, how humid it gets out here. The best thing, that was kind of backstage. I wore like a Bedouin wedding jacket on stage. It was like velvet and quite warm and gold threaded. Which, and that, that jacket's hanging in the uh, Woodstock Museum at uh, Bethel Woods in uh, Bethel, New York. Did you they have it in glass right by the ladies' room, so you can be sure it gets a lot of visits. <laughs> So did you give it to them? It's on loan. You'd think the least they could do if you're going to give that to them is to chisel his goddamn name on the plaque. I know there have been people that have tried to get the plaque rewritten. There are a number of people, uh, artists, much better known than Bert, that uh, were left off. But for some reason, it hasn't been done. I don't know. I have no control over that. But I do agree with you. It would be nice to see, see his name on the plaque. Thank God we're on the wall in the museum. Andy Zax's, th that release is a monumental and major release. I heard every single second of it. It's a day and a half long. If you were to sit down and just listen to it, mm -hmm. I've listened to every moment of it. And it is uh, phenomenal. And the fact that history wrote this thing out, the performance is, it, it's incredible, especially considering, you know, like Crosby, Sills and Nash, you guys are kind of premiering here. You know, to go back, when you answered that ad that you read in the Village Voice, that was Bird Summer looking for a guitar player, how far before Woodstock was that? Okay, well, Woodstock was in August. Uh, the ad, I believe, I, when I finally found the ad after trying to research it, I think it was the first week in May. I have the ad somewhere in my files. But uh, the first week in May of 69, it was a uh, Capitol recording artist, first album just released, looking for an accompanist to uh, go on the road. I was between bands at the time. I answered the ad. It was a Murray Hill number. And the person that answered the ad was Bert Summer. <laughs> and uh, he must have been in his manager's office at the time or something. I think it was the manager's phone number. I knew he wrote for the Vagrants at that point. I mean, you um, hadn't met him because you're... I ha I'd see him walking around. I mean, I was there for Leslie, uh, hanging out with Leslie, and there'd be this tall kid with big hair walking around. I really didn't know Bert or what he did or anything about him. At that phone call, we made the connection. He was uh, starring in Hair at the time. He said, well, come up after the show tomorrow night and let's get together together and uh, that's when uh maxine and i went out and we we actually we saw the show got us tickets after the show we went back up to his apartment on 45th and uh, 8th actually we sat down to play and tuned our guitars down to open d at the same time to do jennifer and that started it and that was in may and at this point he's already released the road to travel and he's working on inside bird summer uh yeah there were cuts done on that uh road to travel was out I, this was an, i think it came out in january it doesn't sound right for a record release but as best as i can recall it was just early 
earlier that year and he was getting ready to do a tour between may and august are you guys just rehearsing are you yeah yeah, we're rehearsing a lot at various studios in the city, and they all had uh, equipment there. So I just had to show up with uh, my guitars. There'd be a Hammond organ, there'd be amps, there'd be a PA. Now, it's enough to make me want to weep that you're not on those fucking records. With Bert, uh, for me, it's only very, very slightly diminishing returns as his records go. I don't think he's released anything that's not good. Uh, but. He wrote the travels my favorite lp the next one a little bit less next one a little bit less but one thing that's for sure is that from the second record on the accompaniment feels although good it feels a little tacked on especially some of that truck stop boogie stuff and so there was never mention or any discussion with artie kornfeld about a more tasteful accompanist like iris stone being involved well first of all artie at the time he used his guys who were david spinoza yuma kraken ron frangipani i mean he used killer studio guys and that was where he was coming from with his musical history and position in the industry. So I remember, yeah, um, the second album came out after Woodstock and was mostly done, but not totally done. But he wasn't about to start to put in Bert's live bass player. I forgot who played bass on the album or Ira Stone, you know, virtually an unknown guitar player against a guy like Hugh McCracken who played on Paul Simon and God knows how many other records. So that's why. And yeah, we always wanted to be on the album. Finally, by the time the third album came, after we did The Bitter End and Carnegie Hall, at that point, Bert said, hey, I want Ira on the album. So he got me uh, to do a guitar solo on uh, the third album. What song are you on? The song that people will come together. You know, that was purely thank you, Bert. Bert said, I want my guy to, put, to play on something on this album. It's the third album. Yeah, we were an album. We were almost finished with the first two, but let me get him on here. So that's how that happened. Yeah, Otherwise, man. Artie would have used the people he was very comfortable with and who were great guitar players. Yeah, yeah. No, no one's doubting the technique, but technique and feel are two different things. And we lived with Bert. That's where the feel came in. We lived, breathed. Bert would play a new song for us. We'd be sitting on the floor in his living room. He'd be sitting cross-legged like he did on stage at Woodstock. He'd play songs that would blow our minds. Yeah. That never got recorded. And we had no uh, say in what got recorded. Uh, Maxine and I have recorded two of his unknown, unreleased songs over the years that have stuck with me. I still play another one that we've never recorded on piano. They're just such great tunes and they never got out there. And What, what are those songs called? Well, one uh, we call the Railroad Tune. I, that's on our YouTube channel. Jeanette as well, it never appeared. Well, Jeanette, well, Jeanette should have been released. That never was. There was another one. When I met one night with Bert, there were two women with Bert. One was Jeanette, one was Eleanor. Jeanette, he wrote, and we did at Woodstock. Eleanor was one of the other songs I'm talking about that's just absolutely beautiful that was never, never released. And the third one that wasn't released, I think, is a killer tune that he did later when he was up in the Troy area was a tune called um, Radio. Radio, okay. Yeah, and Radio and um, the Railroad tune are on my YouTube channel, just recorded uh, by, uh, by me and Max. But and never released by Bert, but they were brilliant songs. And there were a lot like that. Only looking at I Wondered Where You'd Be, what a great song, performed at Woodstock, terrific song, great performance, and it was a holdover that came out on the third record. I mean, this guy, at this point, great art is is just dripping out of this guy. He's like streaming out of him. I always liked that song. I especially liked it at Woodstock because it's almost like a folk song with a bluesy Hammond solo in it. You know, a lot of the songs we did at, at Woodstock came from the feel we had when the three of us were together in a room and some of the songs were were written either close to when uh, the first album was released or actually on that album. And there was a, a feeling that just got generated to what you wanted to hear behind it. Once you took it into a studio with studio musicians and Artie's vision, who was the, the one in control at the time, it has a different feel. He yeah. was thinking more in terms of how can I get this guy 
uh, on the radio a lot, we were thinking about just sitting and playing the music and feeling it. Smile is an absolutely perfect version of that song and is a perfect Woodstock set closer. And then the record begins with a version of Smile that from the very second it starts, I know it's great song, not a good arrangement. It's not a compassionate arrangement of what the song actually is at its heart. Bert's three albums, first three albums, were Artie's vision, and um, we really didn't have any say in that. And he put Bert on on the map, got Bert and us into Woodstock, and uh, that's that's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you, Artie. Yeah, look, it's, uh, you know, it, he obviously cared for Bert, uh, cared about Bert, and uh, did a lot for him. But, you know, if we're going to be completely honest here, the version of Smile at Woodstock, that is the definitive version. It's not the version on the record. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. There's no um, question about it. So, uh, you know, as far as the experience of Woodstock goes, you know, I've read just sort of like flying in on the chopper, not really knowing how big this thing was going to be. <laughs> Try to get back there in your head and, and tell me what it was like. Were you nervous? What, you know, what was going on with you? Back in New York at the time, late spring, early summer, 69, all you heard about this music and art festival that, that that's going to happen with the Who and various acts. And, and then we find out that we're playing there. So well, that, that's, that was great. Our first gig, we drive up the night before and Max and I are in my my uh, girlfriend, soon to be wife's Plymouth Fury driving up. We get to the hotel, motel, whatever it was. I think it was a holiday and I don't remember. Just had a great night. Everyone was there. We had some of the, I remember Tim Harden came into our room and a guy named Jerry Morrison, I think, who used to hang out with Hendrix. And we were just very relaxed, partying, having a good time. The next day was Woodstock. So I guess Friday, I'm sure it was like one, two o'clock, something like that. We head out in a station wagon and we get stuck like everyone else on the road. So here we are stuck in a, a field on the side of the road with um, the Swami, such a Nandan, I hope I pronounced his name right. Tim Harden. I can't remember if it was Summer Sweet Were There were Tim Harden's band. That's right. Dallas McCain was there, and, and we're waiting for the chopper to come. It finally comes, and it would take us two by two over the hill. We had no idea. We, we thought there would be little booths, people selling arts and crafts, and a stage for music. Till the chopper picked us up, and I think Max and I had went first. Once it went over the hill, over the ridge, as you got up high, all you could see was like, thousands of undulating colors and my wife said to the chopper pilot what is that and he said those my dear people then we land and we get off and we just can't believe it then bird came over you remember uh, how you were feel were you nervous were you no not nervous at all we walked up to the stage richie havens was still playing i guess we went on stage after he finished just got a feeling for it. As a matter of fact, we sat on stage for the whole set of uh, Sweetwater, and that was the second time that we were back on. When I look at the photographs now of Sweetwater on stage, in the back line behind Nancy Nevins, there's me, Maxine, Bert, John Wilhelm, Charlie B. We're all there. So we we're waiting to go on, but we weren't, we weren't nervous. I remember when Sweetwater finished, I sat down at the Hammond organ, make sure everything was on work, and then I walked over to, to pick up the guitar for Jennifer. Bert sitting cross-legged barefoot on the stage. We were ready to go. I, he just he looked at me, looked in the other direction at Charlie, and just started. And, uh, you know, the thing about being nervous is it was just, it was almost like we were still playing in a, in a rehearsal studio or Bert's living room. You looked out and you saw thousands and thousands of people and colors. But the thing that really got me was a second song. It was after Jennifer. It was uh, The Road to Travel, the title song from his first album, because I was playing harmonica. And literally, I never played harmonica before live in front of people, except in bar bands. <laughs> but there was harp on the record, and I learned the part. And as soon as I hit the first note, you could hear it echo from these gigantic speakers on the towers that people were climbing on. And I went, oh, my God, it was, you know, it was like something I will never forget. What's insane about life, especially when obviously the ripples of this experience 
are still reverberating for you over 50 years later. But yet, you know, the whole thing goes down in 45 minutes. So when you're, when you're, when you're right there uh, attempting to stay and be and remain in the moment, are you knowing that, holy shit, I'm being swept up by the tides of history and this is a game changer? Or Not at all. Not at all. I knew I had to go from guitar to the ham and walk back for, uh, for things are going my way, pick up an electric guitar. You know, it was, you're in the moment of, uh, I want to get from here to there. After and when it's over, I know there were Vagrants fans. This was New York. The Vagrants were big in New York. And Bird wrote that tune. Vagrants had released it already. Right. We did that song. Uh, in fact, the lead singer from the Vagrants was up there with us, Peter Sabatino. You know what I love about that is that he he calls out the Vagrants. At the yeah, 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 oh. yeah. And there's a recognized round of applause there. Yeah, right. Well, of, of course. And here, I mean, I loved the song when they did it for years and they recorded it. Here I am getting to play it on Hammond organ like my dream. We finished the song and there's big applause. And at that point, we realized, wow, this is really something. There are all these people out there that they are liking what we're doing. Then we get up to, I think it was the seventh or eighth song we did, America, Paul Simon's tune, America. Yes. And after that song, all hell broke loose. It was definitely the first, from what the historians are telling me, the first standing ovation of the festival. That was phenomenal. The length of the, everything. I mean, it was just, it was beyond. Then we did uh, a song from the first album that, that I love of his about uh, suicide. A note that read? A note that read, which is another killer song to play on Hammond. I mean, the, the whole line, I, whatever they used on the record, strings, horns, I don't even remember. But to play that on an organ was such a thrill, and to hear him sing it. And then we did Smile, and that was it. It was over. Hey, yeah. we played it. <laughs> But yeah. we had no idea what it was going to be. You know, when we had a clue, I mean, we knew about all the stuff on the news, I guess, later that weekend when we got home. We got a call from Max's mother, whose sister had a copy of Life magazine. She said, Maxine's in Life magazine and the centerfold with all the bands. And, and then we realized, well, I we didn't even know Life magazine didn't issue on it. Here it was out. They cut me and Bird out, and there's Max's picture in the middle of it. By the way, just to you know, peek back into... Uh, the performance of America, first yeah. standing ovation of the whole festival, and what does he what does he do? He introduces you, right? Oh, right. that's right, that's right. Yeah, I forgot. Right, he introduces the band, which is really cool because that he that he could have taken that as a moment of like, yeah, they're clapping for me, but no, that's he's spreading the wealth right at that moment, which is a real classy move, I think. Well, your assistance and uh, participation in making sure that this historic gig got off without a hitch is greatly appreciated by, you know, obsessive listeners like myself. I really want to thank you for anyone listening to this. You want to go full bore and do a deep dive into the Ira Stone universe. I heartily recommend it. Uh, Ira, thank you so, so much for doing this and setting the record straight a little bit on a, a great talent who deserves a reconsideration. Uh, well, thank you for having me on i appreciate it i'm right outside your front door right now please let me in <laughs> and don't worry soldiers of sound if you haven't gotten enough of iris stone there are plenty of stories left in the coffer trust me you're not going to want to miss his tales of living the rock and roll dream touring with the music explosion playing with leslie west and the vagrants a more in-depth examination of playing at woodstock and what happened with his collaboration with burt summer post woodstock it's all there on Patreon. Hey, lads and ladies, Dave Gebro here. I abandoned my career and moved my family 3,000 miles to be able to focus exclusively on discography. And so if you're like me and enough is just never enough, then please visit patreon.com slash discography and become one of our Patreon soldiers of sound. Discography is an entirely listener supported show, and it's also intended to be a three times a week music deep dive experience. So do us both a favor and consider giving it a shot. Trust me, I'm working hard for the money, so hard for it, honey. There's the main show on Saturday, a Monday wildcard episode in which the plunge deepens even further, which is either an interview with that week's guest or an offshoot show like Rock Cousteau and Queasy Listening. And then on Wednesdays, there's the humdinger of them all, Discography's The Private Press with Paul Major. 
you got nothing to lose. If you don't dig it after a month, you're refunded. No questions asked. Once again, that's patreon.com slash discograffiti. Is it really true that this is Bert's first ever concert? Like his first gig? It's his first live gig. Other than people's apartments and hanging out in a park. Yes, that's not an exaggeration. Would you say that this unending flurry of opportunity and excitement in Bert's life, when I've tried to isolate the moment where things started turning, it was the introduction when he was introduced as Mr. Bert Summers. Looking back, it's easy to focus on that because then it became repetitive. Certainly Ira is not happy about the fact that he was only alluded to as, quote, some of his friends. It's something to notice because things can happen in the blink of an eye that can mm -hmm. be transformative. And I believe that that moment, just look at previous to this moment, it was just all good. It was things are going my way, right? So, and this is the first thing that doesn't, and then it just does not stop from that point forward. Just as a whole, I think his set, I think literally every moment is perfect. Even the F-bomb that he drops to toughen things up, uh, if only for a moment, it's just note perfect. And I give it five stars. On a scale of one to five, I give his Woodstock set 10. It was so good knowing that he got that first standing ovation, and then he ends with Smile, which is maybe my all-time favorite song by him and it's just it makes me cry because you know that it's uh kind of downhill from there but mm -hmm. for that moment he was rather magnificent as john morris pointed out at, afterwards i wish that one day and i know we've all talked about this forever we could see the video from this the, the entire set you know it's in the vault somewhere i guess unfortunately the entirety of the record of his performance having even occurred in the film is Joan Baez <clears throat> wandering backstage saying, who's on? And then a stagehand says, a guy named Burt Summers. I think Timmy Harden's going on next. Neither of them knew who Burt was, and that was all of Burt on record as having performed there. A picture of the backup band appeared in a special Life magazine at the time, and Summer was cropped out. <clears throat> he was also missing, obviously, from the documentary. Never appeared on any of the soundtrack albums, except, obviously, the most recent one, which is, if you're listening to this right now, you should at least have a stolen copy of it. Ira is quoted as saying that Burt was on Capitol Records. His record company was not included because Warner had rights to the whole thing. So Burt never got into the original movie, apparently for that reason, according to Ira. When Warner's acquired the rights to the festival, Artie Kornfeld say in the festival's afterlife, even though up to that point, it was 100% right place, right time, it essentially ended there. And so did his ability to protect the artist he had been supporting. When a commemorative plaque was installed at the site of Woodstock, Bert was left off and his name has never appeared in print in time. Jesse, his son, said he was really upset about that. It killed Bert that he was not on the commemorative plaque slab. And why they have not corrected that is just beyond the pale. I have no idea. They could have fixed it. They painted every year. All right, that about does it. A heartfelt discography thanks goes out to our graphic designer, Todd Zimmer, my beautiful wife and son, Jen and Mason, our guests, Angie Pope, Sharon Watts, and Iris Stone, my incredibly loyal fans, and especially the entire Patreon community. I love you all, and this show would not exist without you. But wait just a minute. This is just the entrance to the rabbit hole. No need to stop now, because we're on a roll. Join us and descend down, down, down the rabbit hole on yet another deep dive. Be sure to go directly to Ira Stone Parts 1 and 2, or Burt Summer Part 2, which is coming up next week, and Episode 1 in our We Are Stardust, We Are Over series, Sweetwater. Subscribe to our Patreon and keep your ears peeled throughout the week, because this Monday continues our deep dive with our Patreon-only wildcard episode, Music Industries, wherein we discuss the shittiest jobs imaginable that we all had back in the day. Not to mention Wednesday's incredible Patreon-only episode of Discograffiti's The Private Press with Paul Major, wherein we'll be covering the amazing Fane Jade's introspection of 
a Fane Jade recital, which is truly a kind of bedroom Sergeant Pepper. That's patreon.com slash discograffiti. This is an entirely listener-supported show, and I offer a full no-questions-asked money-back guarantee. So if you dug this episode, you don't have an excuse. Check it out right this second. Thank you so much in advance. And be sure to mark your calendars, because next Friday, March 17th, we're coming at you with Burt Summer Part 2, in which we stand by helplessly and watch this bright, shining star plummet to Earth post-Woodstock. And so, from now till then, don't let our youth go to waste, lads and ladies. It's Discograffiti! Discograffiti!